This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. But this is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Sarah Laffer Hurdy, who is um, emerita professor at UC Davis, uh, and also the current uh, proprietor of Citrona Farms, and um, the author of, of many wonderful books, uh, including the the woman who that never evolved, uh, Mother Nature, and and this one right here. Uh, though, by the way, I have both of those books uh, somewhere buried in, in boxes. Uh, and this one, of course, is the one that we'll discuss mostly, Mothers and, and Others. And, and I have to say, uh, Sarah, when I was reading this, I, I actually have in the margins in about a half a dozen places, I just have the word wow, because <laughs> there were so many just incredible observations and insights uh, and studies that were done um, you know, not you're, you're referencing these studies that, that just, uh, that just really blew my mind because they, they illustrated things that, that I wasn't uh, aware of, even though I've been reading in this literature for, for, for many years. Um, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Glad to join you, by the way, about, um, the walnuts. Of course, it's my husband, Dan, who does most of the growing of the walnuts. I do the habitat restoration part. But uh, he's a retired doctor, and he says he does more good for human health growing walnuts than he ever did as a doctor, and he wasn't a bad doctor. <laughs> well, that's that 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 sounds like a topic for another another show. Um, you know, it should uh, be, yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> right? And nuts, and, by uh, the way, have a lot to do with with um, human evolution and why we're so dependent on omega threes. So yes, that, another show. That's right. Uh, well, I think we might get a chance to talk about that, particularly the role of, okay. of grandmothers yeah. and 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 you know why maybe the uh, existence of grandmothers in, in humanity is due in part to our our diet. Um, and maybe <laughs> right. you know, we we might be able to get food. that. But no, well, food overall, yes. Yeah, um, and I, I interviewed uh, Richard Wrangham, who um, of course has a has some theories about this um, uh, about cooking. I think you're you're more. Uh, you have a great discussion about tubers and uh, and and nuts and and their role in evolution. And what I didn't realize yeah. is that um, that humans do have this unique enzyme that helps us to process uh, tubers, and that it's not uniformly distributed throughout the human population. Yeah. Starch digesting so enzyme. Yes. Yeah. So let's let's start with the you know. <laughs> Your grand idea. I mean, this is this is the idea. The central idea behind mothers and others is is really a, a profound one, and it's and it's one that it's it's surprising that it had not been articulated prior to this book. You know, all of us are interested in what makes humans special and different uh, from the other great apes, and you know, we we focus on our use of language and we focus on our our theory of mind, and and I think that. Probably the, the dominant hypothesis for this had to do with what we might think of as, as Machiavellian behavior mm -hmm. uh, or and selection in favor of this behavior, which mm -hmm. uh, f facilitated both kind of in-group status achievement and then, um, you know, success in, in uh, out-group warfare. And, and this is, of course, a story about kind of, uh, you know, male selection uh, and then mm -hmm. those other consequences for the rest of rest of us were sort of uh, sort of you know secondary byproducts. Uh, you offer a very very different uh, hypothesis, uh, which I, I think you articulated very well. Could you, in a nutshell, uh, just articulate that for us, if you had to I had can't to summarize do it? In a it. nutshell, I don't do <laughs> elevator pitches, but I can sure tell you. Um, well, we've got a whole hour, but but uh, okay, I wanted to well, put it, I'll, let I'll you do it in your words. Then, um, First of all, the hypothesis that an ape with the life history attributes of Homo sapiens, these very long periods of child development and big costly brains, costly babies, um, this particular ape in the line leading to the genus Homo could not have evolved unless mothers had had a lot of help. And that really was a conclusion I came to writing a book about maternal love and ambivalence, Mother Nature. So by the time I finished Mother Nature, which was published in 1999, I realized, oh my goodness, our ancestors must have been cooperative breeders where mothers had help caring for and provisioning 
their offspring from others. And the old hypothesis was it was, oh yeah, it was man the hunter who was father the provisioner. But it turns out when you actually look at the evidence for people still living by hunting and gathering in Africa today, and you go back to the paleontological evidence, a man on his own could not possibly have brought in enough calories. And the data we have, the ethnographic data from uh, Richard Lee for the Kung and for James O'Connell, Kristen Hawks, Blurton Jones, Frank Marlowe, that crew, Brian Wood, working with the Hatsa, is that only about 40% of the calories that come in annually are from meat and honey brought in by men. 60% of the calories come from plant foods gathered by women, but a disproportionate number of those calories is coming from older women who aren't actually mothers at the moment. They're grandmothers and great aunts and other kin. So that it's pretty clear that allo parents, that is group members other than parents, in addition to parents, are helping to care for and raise offspring, which is the kind of, that's the definition that the ornithologist came up with years ago for cooperative breeding. It really comes from birds. And of course, mm-hmm. birds are one of those species with a lot of biparental care. There's no lactation. So males are just as capable of feeding as females are, and they're doing a lot of the feeding. So about 9% of 10,000 species of birds have cooperative breeding, which is you know, it's 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 a it's evolved many times, and of course there are lots of social insects with cooperative breeding and more. They go all the way to use social. Um, and when you get to mammals, though, because of lactation, lactation is huge. Because of lactation, it's almost always mothers, and often mothers by themselves. And about only three percent of mammals breed cooperatively, and it's a little bit more in the carnivores. It's about, um, I think it's more like 16%. And then it goes way up in the primates, maybe 20 something percent in primates. But that's mostly because of this subfamily of distantly, distantly related New World monkeys, marmosets, and tamarins, uh, where there's a whole lot of cooperative breeding. So it ups us. But that said, across primates, which of course are, tend to be highly social, there is a lot of allo-maternal care with infants. It's just there's not a whole lot of allo-maternal care plus provisioning, which is what you need. And a lot of the people who study um, mammals with that they call cooperative breeders, there actually isn't a whole lot of food sharing. And food sharing in humans over the course of our evolution has been huge. And that brings me then to, so I'm committed to the idea that over the course of the Pleistocene and maybe even starting earlier back in the Pliocene, our ancestors were beginning to have cooperative breeding. That is mothers were relying on Alla mothers, male and female alla mothers. You have to, ra- it's hard to wrap your brain around the idea there could be a male alla mother, but of course there can. All an alla mother means, it's from the Greek allo, other than. So someone other than the mother who's helping. And of course it can be a male as well as a female, as it so often is in birds. Um, so the thing is, once, you, and this is where my contribution, I think, comes in, is once you have cooperative breeding, there are implications. There are implications for mothers. There's implications for fathers and men in general, for allo mothers. There are implications for grandmothers, and there are big implications for the infants who have to manipulate this system and and survive in it. And so mothers, for example, this is really something that came to me when I was researching Mother Nature, which was a a very personal book. It I started researching it back in 1977 when I gave birth to my first baby. And I I loved her very much, but it didn't take me long after we brought her home from the hospital 
to realize that I had a certain amount of ambivalence about being left at home all day with this child who I wanted to respond to. I certainly believed in that. I was, of course, I had, as a primatologist, I'd closely read Bowlby and I knew all about attachment theory. And I was wondering, well, wait a minute. Why on earth, if I evolved, wouldn't I be perfectly content to turn my life over to this little gene vehicle? But I wasn't. I felt ambivalent about it. I was ambitious. I was working. I was a postdoc. And I wondered, where was this coming from? And of course, over time, the answer dawned on me. It's because I didn't evolve to raise that baby by myself. I've always... um, Hominin, that's the bipedal apes on the line leading to Homo sapiens. Hominins have always been uh, mothers, have always been working mothers. They've always had to do other things in addition to care for their babies. Plus, their babies were starting over the course of the Pleistocene to come faster and faster because Pleistocene hominins had a really big problem, which is they weren't breeding enough, fast enough to survive the conditions, these horrendous climatic conditions. The Pleistocene is a real lesson for humans today, which we only barely squeaked through. It's just a miracle, that, and it's only through cooperative breeding that they managed. But all the other bipedal apes, and remember there were several dozen species of them, Artipithecus and all these Australopithecines, and there are lots of different bipedal apes out there. They all went extinct. It was just our line squeaked through. And I think the fact that we were beginning to buffer youngsters from starvation during this long, long period when they were still dependent, but their mother was going to have to have another offspring. Because, you know, most hunter-gatherers are, I think the average birth interval is about two and a half years, which is much shorter than in chimps, maybe four years much, much shorter than orangutans. You know, those mothers have like eight, nine-year birth intervals. That that was a road to extinction for bipedal apes in the Pleistocene. But we didn't take that road. Uh, We started to share food more and also share food in ways that helped to provision these infants. So the big effect on mothers I think this had is it made, they had to be exquisitely sensitive to how much social support they were going to have before they even continued the enterprise of rearing a baby. And it's it's a very tricky subject to talk about. Um, but you, you may or may not know that, you know, my entree into science was actually through the study of infanticide. And that's, it's fairly common in traditional societies. And it's just part of who we are. Um, a lot of babies that are conceived, of course, never make it to birth. The majority, if there's a, if there's a, uh, mother nature is probably the biggest abortionist in the world. Um, so if God created us, we see where that leads us. Um, well, what's interesting is I think for, for people studying evolutionary biology, uh, who are interested in humans. Um, they they pay most of their attention is to our nearest neighbors, right? They'll focus on on chimps and, and bonobos. Yes, yeah. Um, I call and, that the troglodytean bias. Yeah, and so even though um, they're probably closest to us in terms of you know theory of mind to the extent that you know, mm-hmm. but it's these these more remote primate ancestors, the uh, Kalamakids. I I just I didn't know that word. Yeah, yeah. That well, they we, don't our, have, our our our, our parental style is closer to them. Right? Hmm? Uh, they don't uh, pay attention to what you're looking at. Uh, chimps have a rudimentary theory of mind, all right, and they're very good at at using it in competition to outcompete someone else for food or for deceiving a rival. So, for example, uh, wonderful anecdotes in the literature about a subordinate male who's trying to entice a female and the dominant male walks by and he covers his erection with his hands. Okay. I mean, that's deception. Or they give a food Mm -hmm. call when they want everyone to scatter and there's no food where they're calling them to be. They're perfectly capable of that. And I think one of the most telling 
studies for me, it was just very foundational for my thinking, was the study years ago that Mike Tomasello's group at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology at Leipzig did. Um, Esther Herman was the first author of this article in Science, and they had come up with a battery of tests to, to look at the cognitive and social capacities com that you didn't need to be able to use language to take the test. Mm -hmm. So they had this special battery of tests, and they had a remarkably large sample. They had 105 chimpanzees, about 101 two-and-a-half-year-old humans, and they had about 30 or so orangutans. And what they found is that in terms of cognitive capacities, that is assessing many versus few or assessing causality, what happens when you push something with a stick, it falls over. Chimpanzees and two-and-a-half-year-old humans are pretty much on the same wavelength, remarkably similar. But the differences showed up when they looked at socio-cognitive capacities, like learning to follow, to imitate a demonstrator. Other apes can imitate, but they're just not as good at it as two-and-a-half-year-old children are. And they have a rudimentary theory of mind. They are aware that someone else knows something different from what they know. They, they, they have that figured out, but they're just not as interested in what someone else is thinking and feeling. Those are where the differences really start to show up, which is why these guys are experimental psychologists. And so they really want these clean experiments where they can measure and compare and control their, 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 their studies. The psychiatrists are less interested in that. And in a way they were more useful to me. And they, they talk a lot about intersubjectivity. And that's being really interested in what someone else thinks and feels and what they think about you. And that gets to be just critical in humans. And that's where this cooperative breeding hypothesis and its effects on, effects on youngsters really gets interesting. Because let's say that you are a newborn ape born to a mother who is... Her commitment to you is a little more contingent than that of, say, a chimpanzee or a gorilla mother. It, it is true that sometimes an inexperienced or very young chimpanzee mother who doesn't quite know what to do is not a very good mother. But once a female chimpanzee is experienced, she is a totally dedicated, single-minded mother, the, the kind of thing Jane Goodall just, you know, lionized in her early work about old flow. She's going to hold that baby skin to skin in close contact, not let go of it for a moment for the first six months. 24-7, she's in contact with that baby. And frankly, if I were a chimpanzee mother, I wouldn't let my baby go either because either other females in the group to whom she's not related or other males, they wouldn't mind eating her baby. It's a nice source of lipids. And infanticide is, of course, a major source of mortality in across the great apes, but also in many, many species of primates, 51 species to be exact now. It was controversial back when I first talked about sexually selected infanticide in primates. I don't think it's so controversial anymore, except in some little pockets of the social sciences. A, a silo, Greg, I don't pay attention to anymore. Um, but these babies have to look good. They have to appeal to their mother. I think there are a number of reasons why infant humans are so much fatter at birth than an infant chimpanzee or gorilla. And it's a strange thing because right before that baby's going through the birth canal, it's a narrow birth canal in humans, tight squeeze, they're putting on weight. They're putting on fat in their shoulders in places you wouldn't expect them to. What's that fat about? I think partly it's thermoregulation. That's been suggested. It's also fat to fuel the lipids you need to fuel that brain development. But I think it's also over time as hominins associated looking good at birth with being full term and a good bet for survival. I think it was an advertisement to their mother. I'm a keeper. And a very image, a very 
uh, a not full term baby uh, would not necessarily be kept. Uh, and with good reason, because they had, it was a poor prognosis for survival. Um, there may even be, have been an association with long term bad effects. I don't know. But it was a hard life. And this is such a touchy subject. It's a difficult subject to talk about. But I, I'm afraid it's probably true. Maternal ambivalence was real. And so babies had to look good at birth. If their mother's commitment seemed to be kind of lagging, they needed to rev it up. But then about the time that a mother is starting to deliver solid foods, maybe beginning around six months, uh, pre-masticated food, kiss-fed food, say saliva that is uh, just, you know, made a little more attractive by very sweet baobab potter or honey. Um, mothers were giving this, but so were others. And so around the age of six months, babies are really needing to appeal to other group members. And this is, of course, when babbling starts. And of course, the old idea was that babbling was a, uh, was a, uh, like training wheels on a bicycle to get mm. language going. But that that's problematic. You have to be very teleological to think that way. You have to say, wait a minute, even before language, spoken language and sophisticated language is useful, we're getting training wheels for it. Mother Nature couldn't have known bicycles were going to be good. So no, I think that it was it was it was beneficial right there in the here and now to make sure that a baby was going to have the reward of allomaternal attention, including maybe a treat to eat. Um, so babbling gets going, but babies have to do something else. We know about kinchin schema, which is why we find babies so just magnetically attractive, why that film by Thomas Balme was a blockbuster. You know, babies, if go see it. You know, it's a wonderful yeah. film. It delights yeah. you. But see it twice and then look at the audience behind you, all these people going gaga over somebody else's baby they've never even seen before. Lots of animals have this kinchin schema. Conrad Lorenz noticed it years ago and wrote about it uh, and came up with the term kinchin schema. It's this magnetism of babies. Um, so, so we're attracted to babies, but babies also have to amp it up because even though they're not in direct competition with other babies, they are in competition to attract that care. And they need to monitor those around them. They need to monitor their attentions. They need to incorporate their preferences. They need to find out what someone else is going to like. They need to start to pay attention to what someone else thinks of them and feels towards them. And they need to care about kind of their their presentation of self, what Irving Goffman used to call the presentation of self. And so Judith Burkhart and I have recently written a paper uh, for the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, which we regard as kind of a, a how-to manual for Pleistocene babies. And it's kind of what you have to do to appeal to others. And in the course of doing that, they are starting to express potentials, which other apes had, but weren't normally expressed. Now think about that over evolutionary time. Mother nature, which of course is my metaphor for Darwinian natural selection, uh, really doesn't care about genes. Mother nature can only act on traits that are expressed in the phenotype. So you have these normally not expressed traits that an ape has the potential for starting to be expressed in a novel, novel phenotype that's being reared, reared under a novel developmental circumstances, under novel developmental circumstances. So you have this novel phenotype expressed to natural selection. Generation after generation, those little apes, they're just a little bit better at appealing to others, at intersubjective engagement, are going to be the best cared for and the best fed, which means that over time, you're going to end up with an emotionally and socially and cognitively very different kind of ape. And I don't really try to explain 
the main human feature film, which is, of course, sophisticated language, these extraordinary abilities to cooperate with others, all that stuff. I see that as coming later. I'm dealing with the prequel to the main human feature film, the kind of bow plan and the networks, the neural networks that have to be set up before language and other things are possible. And I agree with psychiatrists like Peter Hobson, who writes that, you know, wait a minute, before language can evolve, there has to be something else. There has to be this intersubjective engagement. You have to be interested in communicating more. I mean, remember, other primates, lots of animals, ha actually have language. They can communicate beautifully. They can, uh, vervet monkeys can say one cry for predator in the air, another cry for snake on the ground. Marmosets, which don't have theory of mind to speak of, but marmosets have, um, when a male, an owl mother or the father is finding some juicy little morsel, a, a nice little tree frog for the babies about the time they're weaning to come eat, they have a call. Oh, I found something good to eat. I've caught it for you. Come and get it. And then as the development of the baby marmosets progresses, or in this case, it was baby tamarins progresses. This is Lisa Rappaport's wonderful work on teaching and marmosets and tamarins. Uh, but as the um, development progresses and the baby is mature enough to maybe do some hunting on its own, the call shifts. The male alum mother gives a call, found something good, come over here and look. Mm -hmm. It's it, There's all this declarative uh, communication going on, but it's not actually on a par with human language because we're not really saying, here's what I'm thinking about, here's what I'm feeling, here's what I know. That's a little bit different. And if you think of grammar and all the stuff, Chomsky and everybody on the evolution of grammar, what grammar is, is actually a tool. I think Tom Givon, the linguist, is, this is really his idea, uh, that lang grammar is really a tool for helping someone else understand what you're saying. And so much about humans is about helping others understand what we're thinking and feeling and finding out. For example, um, a Japanese scientist years ago pointed out that most other apes, and you can tell this just by visit to the zoo, have dark sclera. You can't see what they're looking at because the pupil of their eye and the sclera is pretty much the same color. Only if they roll their eyes way over can you see any white sclera. Humans have white sclera, and it's to help others know exactly what you're looking at. Other apes don't follow a point. Humans do, except for apes that have reared in captivity, dependent on human allo mothers, allo mothers of another species, but they're a caretaker all the same, they do learn to follow points. Mm. So that it's it's a developmental thing, but it can become uh, inscribed in inherited traits like the white sclera. So the, the thing that makes us human is this emotional maturity or this emotional modernity. And you say that the emotional modernity preceded uh, language. It and, doesn't and guess, make us human. It laid the groundwork. It was, right. it was the, it was the pre-adaptation that's essential. And, and so the, the counterfactual would be right. If, if this inner subjectivity is provides such an enormous advantage, mm -hmm. right. Um, allows us to cooperate and allows us to, to work in groups and so forth. Um, and the, the other great apes have the, the basic machinery that would, you know, allow it to, to evolve. It, it it never happened with them, and and your argument is that's because they don't they don't have the the allo parenting, uh, in in place, and it's allo parenting that that enables it. Or did allo parenting kind of co evolve with, with with this, or did well, allo parenting course, come first? Allo and then co evolved with so much. It evolved mm -hmm. with food sharing and and the Pleistocene effect. But I want to go back to the point you just made because it's such a good one, which is wait a minute. Uh, all the other apes had the raw material for this. Why didn't they evolve inner subjectivity as well? I mean, language would be enormously useful for chimpanzees. And the main theory there, uh, you mentioned Machiavellian intelligence, but the other main theory there is that these cooperative capacities evolved in humans 
because we were fighting with our neighbors and we wanted to wipe them out. And it helped us to, uh, um, you know, and they talk about, oh, if nature is red and tooth and claw, that's because humans were. And, you know, war is because that's basic to human nature. And we've always done it because, after all, Pan troglodytes, the chimpanzee, common chimpanzee, is always trying to kill its neighbors, and I think it's true. They are quite, quite a. Uh, you could almost call them genocidal, which I think Richard Richard does call them, and I think that's true and real. But then you have another question, which is: Okay, if warfare is what leads you to be so cooperative and to develop language and all these traits, how come chimps didn't spend the last six million years developing it as well? Well, the reason is because they didn't have shared care. And that is another whole nother ball game. Because then you're asking, why don't chimpanzees have shared care? Ask me and I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's the question. I mean, there's gotta be something that's that's exogenous, right? Something environmental. Well, but- I think a lot of it has to do with female autonomy in chimpanzees. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the people who pursue this warfare hypothesis have a starting assumption, a very fixed starting assumption, that our ancestors were what's called male patrilocal. That is, sons remain in the same group with their brothers and fathers so that they can be their allies in fighting with other groups because the assumption, probably right, is that males have greater resource holding potential than females do, being a bit stronger. And and that's in in part because not only do we see it in in a number of our uh, the other great apes, but we see it in, 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 you know, post Pleistocene society, right? So in, in oh, at least. Absolutely. After 20,000 years, I mean, there's no, there's no, yeah, well, we'll get to, the, yeah, I, I'm not arguing with the importance of warfare. I'm just saying, was it what helped shaped us in the Pleistocene before the Neocene, before you get to the Neolithic revolution? And, well, or even before the Neolithic revolution, when populations start to build up, and sons have to stay home to help their father defend fixed resources because you're making your own food. You're either herding. And I mean, herders really have to watch out about wrestlers and stuff. So those guys really did need to defend their resources. Plus, the populations were building up. But remember, our Pleistocene ancestors in Africa were widely dispersed. And like the Hadza today or the Kung in the past, um, when they encounter someone who is a problem for them, they just move. Mm -hmm. And they were constantly moving anyway because of their unpredictable resource bases. Their water holes would dry up or game would move or something. But let's go back to your other question, which I love, which is, well, why didn't chimps become cooperative breeders? And I, I think I mentioned that if I was a chimpanzee mother, I wouldn't let anybody touch my baby either, you know? And it's because... I think you said that they're they're... We're, we're both hypersensitive, but uh, but they're hyper possessive and, and we're not. They're, they're very hyper possessive and they need to be because females in chimpanzees, even though it turns out. Well, well, let me just go back to that starting hypothesis of all the warmongers, which is that our ancestors were obligately patrilocal. In fact, and, and we were that way because our a great ape ancestors all have patrilocal or male philopatric breeding systems. In fact, those breeding systems are a bit more flexible than that. So for example, um, a female chimpanzee whose mother is very dominant, like Flo's daughter, Jane Goodall's famous old Flo, her daughter, Fifi, a very dominant mother with a rich territory, she actually will stay put and she will breed in her mother's home territory. She doesn't migrate out like she's supposed to, according to the the, the, the dogma. Um, so about half of Flo's children, about half of Fifi's daughters stay back in their home range and half left. But most chimpanzees do. The females do leave their natal groups to breed and the males stay, which is very different from most circopithecine monkeys, where the Females stay in their natal group. So all the, the, the monkeys with a lot of shared care, not necessarily shared provisioning, they're not full-fledged cooperative breeders, but the monkeys with shared care, almost in order for that to evolve, they have to be there with their close relatives. So for example, the monkeys I used to stay, study, Langer monkeys, live in these 
matrilineally organized groups where mothers remain in the same home range as their mothers and grandmothers for all their lives. And they're about as closely related to the other females in their group as first or second cousins. And there's very, there's very, they trust these other group members and they share their baby and they're absolutely confident if it's a female relative in their own group of getting their baby back safely. Meanwhile, the mother gets freedom to forage and she is relieved of a metabolic load and she can breed a little faster as a result. So it's a win-win. The young females are gaining very valuable experience learning to mother because most people think that, that mothering in other animals is instinctive. But in primates, there's a lot about maternal care that has to be learned. Um, so, okay, the chimpanzee mother isn't going to be willing to share her baby, and it can't get started that way. And they weren't under the same uh, pressures that bipedal apes living in different habitats in Pleistocene Africa were to come up with more exaggerated divisions of labor and food sharing. Uh, other apes do have a division of labor. So, for example, chimpanzees spend, females spend more time termiting and cracking nuts, and males spend more time hunting. Males are the main hunters, not the only hunters, but the main hunters in chimpanzees. So you had a rudimentary division of labor, but it wasn't anything like what develops among African hunter-gatherers. So food sharing gets started. Food sharing is huge. And this this takes us to sort of um, Kristen Hawkes' arguments about the role of grandmothers. And in the monkeys I used to study, grandmothers are tremendously important as they get older. Because, you know, other, other apes have, other primates have menopause too. They have a decline in fertility with age. And it's just that the only things they can do are defend babies against infanticidal male, which is a sporadic occurrence, mm -hmm. or help in intertroop conflicts as they defend their, their larders, their feeding territories. In hunter-gatherers, certainly the African hunter-gatherers, there's something grandmothers could do on a daily basis that was incredibly important, which was bring back food to keep everybody kind of energy solvent. And I think the revelation to Kristen came, it's published in her 1989 paper about hardworking Hadza grandmothers. And of course, they're not necessarily grandmothers because some of them are great aunts. But these are these. And these, these are maternal. Women. They are mainly maternal grandmothers, right? They are, and that's why this whole question of female autonomy and where females were living is so very important. And as we're learning more about the demography of African hunter gatherers and actually foragers worldwide, a paper Kim Hill and his colleagues did years ago, and or not too long ago in Science, showing that. Males and females were about as likely to have close relatives in the group, and there were also non-relatives in the group. They weren't these bands of brothers. Uh, the way the, the the inner group warfare models are built on this assumption of male patrilocality. Other apes are a little more flexible than they were assuming. African hunter-gatherers were way more flexible. Uh, and I, I like the term Frank Marlowe came up with a few years ago, which was that our hunter-gatherer ancestors in Africa were multi-local. Mm -hmm. And so that a, a little ape, a little bipedal ape growing up, if they were anything like their later hunter-gatherers, would have lived with many different kinds of companions growing up. So the, the classic, the, the most typical tradition that you hear about for the Hadza or the Kung would be that a young man looking for a wife might come to live with a group where there's a, a, a young girl growing up of who's about to be fertile, and he might live with them for a while, hunting on behalf of her parents for a couple of years, and then they are, you can call it married, and he might stay there till one or two children are born. So she has her matrilineal kin on hand, to help her. And it's that first birth where you really need help. This is an inexperienced young female. And of course, the more allo maternal provisioning is going on, um, 
the earlier she's going to breed too, which is another story. Um, you could ask me about what's happening to young women today. Yeah, well, um, I definitely want to ask about that. I mean, what what I find interesting yeah. is that when you talk about allo parenting, I mean, to the extent that the father is involved, there there's there's allo parenting, right? I mean, oh, um, it's, no, that's allo maternal care by a male yeah. who is the father. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not allo parental because that's someone who isn't the genetic parent, right? So I, used, you, I have to throw these words around, but you do have to pay attention to whether it's allo maternal or allo parental, and. That the reason I prefer allo maternal is because, you know, as often as not, we don't actually know who the father was. <laughs> well, that's what Even I found interesting marriage, is that, we that, don't know. That, that you said that, um, you know, the presence of a father is is not as as universal as most people think in many societies. And and uh, and, and but it makes a huge difference in a, in a patrilocal environment and much Absolutely less of a difference in, in a matrilocal environment. I think it might, I mean, even in, in prairie voles, it makes a difference. So the father, yeah, yes, it makes a difference. And having two parents is better than one. And having three parents, if you've got an allo mother in there, is even better. I, I used this term once, which has really gotten me into trouble. But, you know, I grew up in Texas, so I grew up playing poker. And I wrote an article once called Grandmothers as an Ace in the Hole. And people thought I was arguing that grandmothers were the be-all and the end-all. Well, these are people mostly in Britain and New England who don't play poker. And they don't realize that in stud poker, if everybody has a bad hand, you don't have a pair, meaning a married couple, you don't have a full house uh, because you don't have a mother and a father and three allo mothers. Uh, if all you have is a grandmother, and she's turned down, as you're, that's the card turned down, that's an ace in the hole. That's going to be a winning hand if everybody else has bad hands. So if you have a bad hand, having an ace down or a grandmother is an ace in the hole, but it's not the be-all and the end-all. But anyway, I got myself in a lot of trouble by talking about an ace in the hole. And if only people played more five-card stud piker, they wouldn't know. <laughs> well, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about uh, attachment theory. Um, I think, you know, when yes. Bobby did his studies that everyone knows about. It was, you know, it, it was a, it was a, a, I think it was a positive development compared to the, you know, the way in which parents. One of all the evolutionists, he's done more <laughs> for human well being than anybody else alive. But, but even, even then the, the, the insights or the inferences were still shaped to some degree by some preconceptions about what ideal uh, family yeah. should look like and ideal maternal yeah. love uh, should look like. Um, you know, how have we, how have we uh, developed a, a, a bit more sophisticated, nuanced understanding of, of, of well, what attachment means? we have means. to go back to what was actually influencing Bowlby at the time. And his templates for, he, 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 he had a brilliant insight that infants need to be warmly attached, that brilliant, right, gift to humanity. And he had another insight, which was our primate heritage was very important, evolutionarily speaking. But he had the wrong templates. He looked to gorillas and chimpanzees and baboons and macaques as his templates for maternal care among our Pleistocene hominin ancestors. And he said he chose them because they were terrestrial and he knew that our ancestors were apes that were becoming mm -hmm. more terrestrial. Uh, the problem was, even, even as early as he started publishing his great trilogy on attachment, 1966, we already had a little bit of information about shared care. And the Langer monkeys that I used to study are actually spending an awful lot of time on the ground. They're quite terrestrial. They're arbo-terrestrial. Um, and yet, they had shared care and that mothers weren't carrying the babies all the time. If he had looked at teeny monkeys where the fathers are carrying the baby all the time, except when the mother's nursing it or at night, or if he'd looked at langer monkeys or patus monkeys, he would have had a very different view of whether you had this, this monotropic view of mother love and mother attachment. And over the course of his life, he did loosen up a bit. I think Mary Ainsworth and her, work in Africa looking at people with more extended families changed him. So 
But if you scratched Bowlby hard, he would always go back to this, mother is important. He was vehemently against mothers working outside the home because he thought mm -hmm. babies need to be. And of course, in developmental psychology, attachment theory has spun off in a cycle of its own. And so you get this attachment parenting, this idea that a mother has to be breastfeeding and be single-handedly mm -hmm. taking care of her baby for five, six years. I mean, it, it's it's really, remember that cover of Time magazine with the mm -hmm. mother with a five-year-old still nursing and stuff? Um, this is hard on mothers, and it's, cert it's not going to be good for the children. Um, the, the work on children who've had extensive allomaternal experience shows that they're much be better able at integrating multiple perspectives. It's kind of like mm -hmm. the cognitive potentials of, of children who speak several languages. It's just very valuable to be able to take into account what other people are thinking as well. And, and you include older siblings as uh, potential allo parents as well, right? I do. And there's this wonderful study um, of of a theory of mind, and saying that you um, catch it from your theory siblings. Theory of mind is uh, Perner and uh, and his co-author. Uh, theory of mind is contagious. You catch it from your older siblings. But then they, they did further work, and they found out that oh, it doesn't actually have to be a sibling. It can be mm -hmm. any kind of older mentor, older child, older ally mothers that you're in relationship with. Yes, having allo mothers in addition to your mother is critically important for the development of theory of mind. And with the nuclear family and, of course, this pandemic where children were locked up, with just, the pandemic has probably been a gift for infants in the sense that it was enforcing paternal leave on a lot of men who might not otherwise have taken paternal leave with their newborns which this is something I'm writing about now, but, but I'm not sure that it was doing those infants a long-term favor if it meant they were only going to be exposed to their fathers and not their grandparents or others their age. And even though I think an extended family is often in many ways going to be advantageous over most daycare in the United States, Good daycare is is really a gift to mothers and children growing up and and to fathers, but for so long our debate has been over, well, are we going to have mother care or daycare? Mm -hmm. When in fact the debate should have been, how do we make daycare better? And I'm I'm very pleased with these new, this new focus in the Biden administration on better daycare and 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 at least earlier preschool, the evidence on preschool and its effects on longer term socialization and education is pretty clear cut. Uh, it should be something that we all are in favor of. And it certainly is part of dealing of producing an effective workforce. Well, it does seem like the nuclear family is, is sort of a, um, uh, a aberration in, in our, development it, it's it's it seems I'm like a blip for the nuclear family has a lot to answer for and and particularly as they get smaller and smaller and we have um you know yes, only children exactly. uh and and i've been reading that mothers now spend more time with their children than they ever have um i'm which, afraid which so <laughs> even in, in, even yes. during the even even during the hunter gatherer days they're they're probably spending more time with their children um do you remember uh, do you remember that that terrible line from the Duchess of Windsor of a, a, another, a woman can never be too rich or too thin. That's not my mantra. My mantra is a, a mother can never have too many aloe mothers. You just can't mm -hmm. have too many. <laughs> you well, probably it, can, but I, you don't well, it, it. I mean, it seems that the organization of, of our society, our economy sort of makes it very difficult for people to have uh, aloe mothers. I, one of my, um, one of my, my goddaughter was, um, uh, her mother was widowed when she was only four years old and, and she lived in a small community. And so she was able to park her daughter at, she had a couple dozen friends, one of whom was me yes. and, and, and she wound up parking her all over the place. And, and, 
And it was just such a, a wonderful thing. And yet I realized how incredibly rare it was that, that people had the ability to, to do that because they didn't live in communities where that was possible. Well, the same daughter-in-law that took your statistics course at Berkeley and said you were a really good teacher, but a little quirky, that same daughter-in-law uh, actually developed an app called Allo, uh, in which people could locate trustworthy Allo mothers and, mm -hmm. and uh, to kind of solve that problem electronically. But to go back to the, the, the whole nuclear family issue, I agree with everything you said. But there's an additional problem, which is architecture and the way our housing mm -hmm. is designed. And everybody wants to be in these independent houses. And I noticed years ago when I was at UC Davis that the graduate students who were living in student housing but had young children were actually better off than the ones who were in their independent apartments. And when you look in France, for example, if I were a graduate student now writing my PhD thesis and I didn't have a lot of help, I'd go to France and, you know, those mm -hmm. école maternales where you can uh, put mm -hmm. your child in daycare. They're excellent daycares, most of them. And the, the women who do the or run them have a whole lot of training. Oh, they have such wonderful food and they, they have a lot of cultural augmentation and they, they have a good facility they they kind of fence them in in these safe areas and then li let the kids have a lot of freedom um I was, I was, and it's it's a wonderful system i was just interviewing and, you someone. know it's interesting that that france hasn't had the same dearth of births that other places in europe japan and of course in this country we're starting to have i was just interviewing um, i was just interviewing someone who was describing how in in uh the city of of, of glasgow uh, they destroyed the tenement housing that was uh, popular uh, and created these more um, inhuman uh, kind of housing what, projects. What a nightmare! Yeah. And it 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 their the life expectancy in Glasgow is is in the mid fifties, um, and and the social capital is yeah, and 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 you know they used to just leave the kids lying around and playing. Do you think that uh, you know you describe how children when they come out of the womb they're 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 they're, they share food. They, they're, you know, they're altruistic in ways that that. Well, not uh, not quite when they come out of the food, uh, out of the womb, but they're actually they're, shortly thereafter. Human babies are extraordinarily altricial, which means helpless, except for there's some funny things about them. Their eyes are open, which the mm -hmm. definition of altricial is you're born with no fur and your eyes closed. But anyway, our eyes. So they're kind of a mosaic. They're 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 very helpless. And they're much more helpless in a locomotor sense for longer than chimpanzees are. Very soon, little chimps could run, literally run circles around a human baby. It's taking them a long time to learn to crawl or walk. But in terms of their social sensibilities, they're amazingly precocial. And they're looking around, you know, little chimps are looking around right after birth too and making eye contact and imitating. But they're not doing, after a while they lose interest. Little humans by nine months of age are much more interested. I mean, Greg, you know, they'll hand out something to you and they'll sort of say, what do you think of this? So they don't mm -hmm. use words, but they're, they want to know your reaction to things. And they are by 18 months. Alison Gopnik there at Berkeley with you showed years ago that by 18 months, sometimes a bit sooner, a human infant will offer food to someone else, even it's a food they hate, like broccoli, because mm -hmm. they prefer crackers, if they know, if they've had reason to learn that the other person likes broccoli better. Well, that's mm -hmm. amazing. And a chimp would never do that. So do you think, I mean, we, we, we raise our children to kind of fear strangers and to, uh, to view the world often as a threatening place. And I think you talked about how um, a feeling of security and a, and a feeling of, of, um, uh, of of um, of attachment to to others is something that helps them to be psychologically uh, healthier yes. later in life. Um, do do you fear that perhaps we we're overdoing it in terms of um, you know raising our our children to be a little uh, sus too suspicious of of others and strangers in the outside world? Well, of course I do. Except uh, that that I guess it would depend on your neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I mean, you, you raised the point about being afraid of your environment. If you grow up with Grimm's fairy tales and these grim German fairy tales 
and um, you know the original uh, Hansel and Gretel story that wasn't the stepmother leaving the kids in the woods that was the mother but but they thought that was too awful so they they bothered it um, so yes if you grew up in Germany you were taught to think of the woods as a scary place but if you grew up as an Aka forager in Central Africa, um, you would see the forest as your friend, as an extension of your family, as a good place and feel safe in it. And I remember reading a story in a book by um, Elizabeth Marshall Thomas once, and of course the Marshall family back in the 50s did one of the first studies living among the Kung. And it was about a, a young Kung girl or a Junwasi um, in the Kalahari Desert and some idiot zoologist had left an animal trap out, not properly protected, and this young girl had stepped in it. And she was caught in this hideously painful animal trap for like 14 hours before people found her and released her. And you'd think that she would be post-traumatic stress, that she would be, uh, she would have almost died from the stress of it, being out in the sun and, and worried and stuff. But in fact, Marshall Thomas writes about how calm she was and just convinced, yeah, they're coming to get me. Uh, I think it is just very helpful. I think it's much more healthy to feel secure in your environment than to not feel secure. I, and that's just almost a truism of life. Right. And so, um, you know, I, when I was reading through the book the whole time, I kept thinking about uh, what kinds of implications that there might be for how we raise our children, how we live and, and so forth. And, um, and I found towards the end of the book, you mentioned that uh, postpartum depression may well be uh, an indication that um, there's not enough social support for the mother and that the mother's essentially going through that, that calculus, which is, um, you know, do I have what it takes? Do I have the, the support that I need to make sure that this, this child's going to be uh, healthy and, and thrive? Absolutely. I, th I think that there's a lot of evidence that a mother attaches to her baby more readily and the attachment is more secure if she has, for example, her own mother living in the house, assuming they get along, or, you know, has allomaternal maternal support. Postpartum depression, though, is interesting because about 10 percent of women, at least, experience some kind of blues, but the serious kind of Psych, almost psychotic mm -hmm. postcard depression is much rare. Um, I, I think part of it is exactly what we were just talking about, a woman who feels like she doesn't have the support she needs. But there are other things going on because in mammals, you have what's called lactational aggression. Mm -hmm. And if you ever have like a female mouse just after she's given birth, she's boadicea in how aggressive and she becomes in defending her babies. And I think women are much more protective and vigilant. But, you know, in our society, it's not socially acceptable for a woman to feel and behave aggressive towards others. Mm -hmm. it, we didn't like that. And it, it really hurts you. If you're running for office and you come across as aggressive and you're a woman, dead in the water. You know, so that, that these women feel like others aren't approving of the way they feel. And they're feeling very vigilant and helpless. So I think lactational aggression may be part of what's going on. Uh, but yes, I think it's also this sensitivity to social support. And the best evidence we have consistent with that is this amazing finding that the people in, in, in Denver, Colorado, in the old studies are finding that these minimal interventions where they send a very supportive, trained woman to somebody's house shortly after she gives birth to talk to her like a friend and advisor. It's not that much time. And yet it has these long-term effects in terms of how long she breastfeeds and later on how long that child stays in school. Mm -hmm. I mean, amazing. And it makes these things they're doing in Britain with these early maternal interventions seem like a good idea. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, we also don't tend to have multi-generational households in, in the U.S. Um, and, and it's not, it's so not they're entirely... they're increasing ever so slightly. And, of course, the last <laughs> recession increased children going to live 
with their families and their partners and then having children living in their parents' home. This has been kind of, you know, it's a gift of the recession. There are all kinds of unexpected gifts from not nice things. But it seems like that certainly the, the norms haven't changed. This is not seen as no. As something... That's right. No, the norms have not changed. We want our privacy. I'm not a fan of privacy, by the way. <laughs> well, I know there seems to be uh, some signs that people who have open doors and and uh, households with continual visitors tend to tend to be healthier, right? Uh, and and live well, longer. Well, there's no child abuse virtually among hunter gatherers because other people wouldn't tolerate it. Mm-hmm. And, and I was surprised also you talked about kind of hospitality. Uh, I've read so many stories about how in some cultures where even when a stranger shows up, there was a great story of an American soldier that wound up in a Afghan household and, and they wound up defending him against, you know, the, the Taliban just because he happened to show up on their doorstep. Right. And, and this idea that, that people are um, generous towards strangers is, is something that is uniquely human. It's uniquely human, except it also is turning out to occur in bonobos, mm. which are just as closely related to us as common chimpanzees. But I, I'm i just suspecting, we, we don't know, of course, but I suspect that what you're talking about, this generosity towards strangers and this willingness to share food with strangers is really, really old. Mm-hmm. And uh, Alison Brooks and, and Sally McBrady published a very famous paper back in 2000 on how at that time people thought that language really only got started 50,000 years ago when hominins got to Europe and that's when their efflorescence of art, this creative explosion, the Chauvet cage and, 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 and all the wonderful cave art and stuff. Their paper showed that there was actually long distance exchange of ochre and arrowheads and obsidian back as early as 150,000 years. That is before anatomically modern big brain homo sapiens was on the scene. So we had to have had some kind of relationships with not necessarily strangers, but people we don't see often. There had to be these exchange relationships. And I suspect that food sharing was a big part of that. But, of course, food doesn't fossilize the way obsidian or ochre does. Um, but if we go back in time, uh, you know, other apes share food, but it's very grudging. And it's usually somewhat reciprocal between allies in hunting or, so, um, you know, and some study sites, they have reciprocal sharing. Other sites, the observers say it never happens here. It's not a big part of their lives, but it was an enormous part of human foragers uh, where, first of all, you had to have sharing between women and men to keep men hunting because otherwise they'd come home empty handed and be hungry and the children would starve. Um, And I think that you had these people exposed to babies begging for food. And if you look across primates, Adrian Yegi and Carl von Schaich have done a lovely study, the only systematic study I know of, of the origins of food sharing and other primates. You don't find food sharing among adults, except in species where you already have adult to infant transfers. Yeah, I find it fascinating because it, you know, it doesn't seem to follow from the kin selection models, right? I mean, obviously, I think and you, you would argue that you're, you're certainly, if your allo parents are... are um, are related, it's it's certainly better for your outcome, but that it doesn't have to be, that there's this... There's well, this. Yes, but we have to be careful. I definitely think you need a very high degree of relatedness within the group for cooperative breeding to get started. Mm-hmm. And That's then it has a take. So then it sort of it takes, takes on a off. life of its own, kind of like mm-hmm. culture. Culture takes on right. a life of its own and it spins out in funny directions. And so the, 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 the thresholds for responding to supplicants gets lower. And there's, you know, there's a lot more oxytocin floating around. There are dopamines floating around when we do something generous. Mm -hmm. This is kind of changing the rules of the game for things like sharing. Yeah. When you said that um, nursing is, is, is like, uh, it's like an opiate uh, for the, for the, for the mother. Um, And also, I guess in a little bit for the father or for even for, for others. I I think when you said that um, if mothers are given a choice, between um, between nursing and, and access to cocaine, uh, they'll they'll choose nursing. Those are mother mice. 
Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> of course, I don't think anybody <laughs> ran that experiment. <laughs> that would be a hard one to get past the IRB, right? Uh, I, I IRBs are so funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Absolutely. Um, uh, about the uh, the oxytocin going up uh, in mothers who are nursing and maybe in fathers too. Do you know when my first grandchild was expected? And I kept threatening my children. I kept saying, you've got to have a grandchild now before my sell-by date because grandmothers are a big asset up to about age 70. After 70, they're less and less of an asset. <laughs> um, and I'm going on 75. So anyway, I, I warned them and they finally did it. And the summer before, we have a summer reunion at the farm, not during the pandemic, but at other years. Um, I got, I enlisted Lee Gettler to do the testosterone samples and my wonderful friend Sue Carter to do the oxytocin samples. And I had my buddies all lined up. I took saliva samples from everyone to establish these baselines. And then after the grandbaby arrived, I had them come in and hold a baby and spend time with a baby. And I, I think that I wasn't really able to monitor compliance with all the protocols of my study that well except in me and my husband because i could really run that run that the run that one the way i wanted but anyway in both dan and me uh in my case within two hours of holding my grandchild for the first time so i land at laguardia and i get a taxi to their house in in in, in harlem uh their brownstone where they're living and on the way there, I take out this little polyethylene tube and spit in it and screw the cap on. And when I get there, I put it in the freezer and then I hold my grandchild for two hours. And then I spit again and freeze that. And anyway, hold the whole protocol. And then my oxytocin levels just surged way up, up by 63% or something. And then when Dan came a couple of weeks later and he gets to the the, the, the thing, even before I hug him, I have to ha pass him a two. I say, spit here, dear, just spit. Mm -hmm. And I freeze that and he holds the baby for two hours the first day. And there wasn't that big a jump. The second day, it took him an extra two hours, it took him a little longer. Mm -hmm. But he had, just by coincidence, exactly the same surge in oxytocin that I did. So we were owl mothers. We weren't parents. I just hadn't undergone gestation. I may have been more responsive because I had been a mother and I had given birth and breastfeed, but my husband hadn't. Anyway, I, I think the, the focus has to be now looking at what happens to aloe parents and aloe mothers as well as to mothers. Mm -hmm. And so all the early work, beautiful early work, you know, uh, Rosenblatt's lovely study, if you took uh, blood from a lactating mother who'd just given birth and you put it into a virgin female rat, she'll start to be maternal. Gorgeous mm -hmm. early work. But they let, they, they was so matricentric. They mm -hmm. forgot that there were all these other characters on the stage. And of course, if you have animals in captivity and they're just put in a cage with a mother and her babies or a mother and a father, you don't even learn about this, but you do learn about it in natural settings. Now there there is a dark side to all of this, I think, um, and you mentioned the, you know, skew and and um, the you social uh, animals, right? The bees and so forth, yeah. and and I think, you know, w w in hunter gatherer society, there isn't a sterile class of of caretakers, no, um, like you do, like you have with bees, but but we do in 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 some more developed societies, right? With um, uh, we do kind of absolutely, nursemaids, and, and, and right. Mother Nature is all about, or there's whole sections of it about how elite women with resources were getting slaves, servants, mm -hmm. very poor women who have to farm their own babies out, almost condemned to death, and come serve as wet nurses. Jane Austen's family, I think, the same wet nurse nursed all their children in that family mm -hmm. and who knows what happened to her own children but they weren't allowed to bring their own children it was seen as right. unhealthy so so enlist enlisting others to help you raise your child you know it's it's not just that they're all beneficent and generous and and uh and maternal but rather they they may fear you or may um uh feel some kind of obligation towards you um <laughs> Hunter-gatherers are special because they really had this ethic 
Um, people always describe them as fiercely egalitarian. They weren't totally egalitarian. I think a, a man could still beat up his wife sometime because he was mm -hmm. stronger. But they were, really. Women had remarkable autonomy, and they had autonomy of movement. And one of the things I, I realized really early on in writing The Woman That Never Evolved was that female autonomy, really, her local clout really influences her her relationship with, with males and how, how much mm -hmm. males can push her around. Um, and in humans, because females are producing, you know, the majority of the calories and they have to move around to get them and everybody has to move around and she has the option to move to be near kin. And so this really changes a lot. Um, and female autonomy is key. But early on, when I first was talking about humans as cooperative breeders, and it was still a little bit controversial, uh, long before I published Mothers and Others, I realized I, was, I had a problem because I was talking about it in a lecture one day and a very fine zoologist, uh, Tim Carroll, who was a, a study at Cambridge with Clutton Brock and all the cooperative breeding mafia there, um, said, oh, but Sarah, hunter-gatherers couldn't possibly be cooperative breeders because they don't have uh, a sterile cast. And, 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 and that, for example, in meerkats, which so much of the beautiful work has been done, really only the alpha female breeds. Mm -hmm. Occasionally a second female might breed. In marmosets, often only the alpha female breeds. But what's interesting is if you look across the natural world in, in, or across wild populations of marmosets, and you often do find there's more than one breeding female, so it's not written in stone. But the dominant female is imposing quite a bit. And she's kind of making the subordinate an offer she can't afford to refuse because she will kill the subordinate's offspring mm -hmm. when it's born. She kind of literally bites its head off and the awful things happen. Um, so this is, and this can happen even when the subordinate female giving birth is her own daughter. So this is the grandmother from hell. This is not the helpful grandmother. And so that's kind of what you were talking about. Um, but I don't think you have that in hunter gatherers. And I think it's because of the mutual dependence mm -hmm. people have on one another. It's a very different situation. And in birds, of course, there's all kinds of, of, um, non-relatives helping. Uh, my favorite is the Splendid Fairy Wren, where years ago, Alexander Coburn in Australia attached little um, uh, electronic monitors on these beautiful, beautiful little flashy birds, very hard to watch. They flit all the time. Um, onto a Splendid Fairy Ring and found out that the females were flying off before dawn, mating with males outside her troop or outside her group coming back and then the males in her group who were not the fathers uh were helping to provision her babies i mean why and how this has persisted one hypothesis is maybe they were her brothers we don't know but or i don't know someone may know um so yeah it 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 it, 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 it can get a little odd and the one one other observation that i found interesting was you talk about how um you know girls from a very young age are um you know, much more attentive to um, the intentions and, and the uh, um, the feelings of others towards them, other girls towards them, and and that this is is them essentially, um, you know, planning at a young, you know, working on their social networks uh, from a very early age to to build out the the support system that they'll need uh, to uh, collectively raise their children. Um, and I found I, this so this was this was sort of just to continue. Not only do the the, the babies are working on their theory of mind in order to uh, secure attention from their allo parents. And then the, especially the girls will start to, um, you know, work on their theory of mind in order to uh, build out their system of allo parents for the next generation. This is what I tell my godchildren, what I used to tell my students when they were, you know, trying to decide whether or not to give birth. And I say, yeah, that's fine, but get your ducks in a row first and, you know, line up the help you're going to need because, you know, these poor women who give birth and want to go back to work and all of a sudden realize, and then they're making really bad decisions when they're looking for daycare. And yeah. instead of really finding out who's going to help take care of that baby, it's really 
oh God, when can I begin? And it's not a good position yeah. to be in. You need to have your ducks in a row. But there's also why, you know, uh, young girls or teenagers who are um, ostracized by their by their fellows, by their classmates, you know, this, this can be such a devastating thing and, and uh, lead maybe. to such psychological problems. Whereas, you know, you might think, well, sticks and stones can break your bones, but, you know, don't worry about what the other kids think. I mean, this is a matter of, of, of survival. In, uh, you know, Greg, I, I, I really believe what you're just saying. I have to tell you that section of my book was pretty speculative. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, that's just what I think. I, I can't point to studies that show that uh, there are, of course, movies and books like Mean Girls, wonderful stuff about yeah. how, how ostracizing these these things are. Mm-hmm. But I think it's girls competing for networks, for relationships. Mm-hmm. And the work coming out of the best studied primates in the world, which are the Amboseli baboon at Gene Altman's site, uh, where Susan Alberts and Joan Selk and others are working now, uh, show that... Um, even leaving aside dominance, and this is a very hierarchical society, even leaving aside dominance, the females with the most friends, the most, the mo- best network females have the highest infant survival rates. What? You know, go figure. Uh, I think this is very important. This um, helps me to understand okay. TikTok better. What? This helps me to understand TikTok and Instagram much better. Oh, don't make me feel bad. I'm such a dinosaur. I, I, I don't use Instagram, TikTok. I won't touch Facebook. <laughs> I think Facebook is probably harmful to human well-being, but never mind. Okay. Uh, well, it's turning us all into narcissists. Um, but you mentioned young girls. Uh, I think from a perspective, a place to seem perspective, what we're doing to young girls is really, really wrong. And from on, on lots of fronts, but in particular, uh, back in the Pleistocene, any girl who was had enough fat on board to ovulate at a young age, by definition, had a whole lot of allomaternal maternal support because these people were helping to provision her because she couldn't possibly get that many calories on her own. So after her baby was born, she was likely to have allomaternal maternal support. Today, we've got these couch potatoes who are ovulating at very early ages, all fed up, and we're not providing them with the sex education and the birth control they need. And to me, this is, this is like sending someone up into an airplane without pressurizing the cabin. It's just wrong. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm disgusted that some of the institutions I'm most involved with seem to not be, they put women's career opportunities top of the radar and they really want women to have equal pay and so forth, but they're not paying enough attention to what's going on, for example, in my home state of Texas with really interfering with reproductive choice, Planned Parenthood. But this is, this is, this is a, a terrible, it's, it's almost a crime against humanity, what we're doing. Well, it's really interesting because the you know the the nuclear family and the patrilocal um, organization of society and the um, the you know isolation from these networks. This was this was sort of a um, historical artifact, and and uh, and mm-hmm. now that with women going back into to the workforce, um, a, a lot of that you, you don't really you don't really need any of that. But but rather than than returning to a, a system where we have uh, these rich networks of, um, of allo parents where we're, we're sort of retaining some elements of the, of that, of that organizational structure, um, which aren't necessarily the best ones. Maybe we can, we can. I, I think that's right. I think they're little slivers of our population, little tiny demographic slivers where there's kind of a recognition of this and things are changing. I'd like to see it spread, and this is actually something I'm writing about now, but I, 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 there's a lot about it that I'm uncomfortable with. I, I don't want to be seen as glorifying the Pleistocene because, mm-hmm. you know, the Pleistocene was fabulous. Let's bring back parasites. Yeah, if you didn't mind. <laughs> Let's bring back uh, malaria. 80, and, 80 and 50 to 80% pox. child mortality, too. Right. We, I don't think we'd like that. And, and part of our problem today though it's perverse, perverse as hell to call it a problem, is that our children survive too well. Mm -hmm. Because parents evolve 
to respond to threats to the survival of our offspring. We did not evolve to respond to psychological distress to a children a child that feels like it's not secure enough in its attachments. And you know, when I was at the university, I I remember having colleagues, you know, young mothers as you know, you must know if you're your age and, and associated with universities, there's just tremendous pressure and, and you just you just don't have a life. There's no work by and they're trying to raise this child and they're doing the best they can and the child is really in distress but can't show it. And I remember kind of being at a faculty arrangement once and kind of wishing the child would just go to the wall and start beating its head against the wall to communicate to its parents, I'm not getting what I need. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're not. And, yeah. uh, well, and, and I think, you know, I think people are very reluctant to, uh, I, in my class, uh, I remember one parent student of mine asked if, if she could bring her child to class. And I said, of course you can bring your child to class, right? I mean, you know, I don't got mind plenty, if it cries, even or, like yeah. bring your, of course you bring your child to class, you know, we've got plenty of space in the back and, and uh, no big deal. But, yeah. but I think that this was, I, I very rare, I've never seen kids in class. I, you know, to, well, you that, know. This, you're very new. You're very modern in this respect. Um, years ago, uh, through various mishaps, um, uh, a birth was delayed and I gave birth to my second daughter, Sasha, just one week before the first international conference on infanticide and animals and man that I was a co-organizer of was about to start in Cornell. Well, we had we delayed the conference because they wouldn't have let me on the little plane to Ithaca if I'd been eight months pregnant or something. Mm. And my co-organizer was just really, I don't know what, hard-nosed. And he said, well, Sarah, of course you can't bring a baby into the auditorium. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is a brand new baby. Well, at that point, Ed Wilson's assistant, wonderful woman, Kathy Horton, uh, knew, had a friend who had an eight-month-old baby, and she had lots and lots of milk, more milk than she needed. And we made an arrangement in exchange for wine. She would breastfeed Sasha during that week, during the day, and I would only breastfeed her at night to keep my breast milk from getting mm -hmm. too you know, and I was taking a big chance because mm -hmm. after, you know, she might not have come back to the normal nursing. But anyway, it did work. And I took a nurse with me to the conference. But it was just so inhumane mm -hmm. that I couldn't have that baby in the in the conference. But now you can. And I remember being at a, a Dalim conference that Sue Carter organized in Berlin and almost bursting into tears at one of the sessions. I was so emotional because it was the first time I'd ever been at a conference where they actually had a session on daycare for women in, who were working women. And I thought, yes, yes, please. <laughs> but it's changing and it's all changing faster than I would have thought possible in my lifetime. It's not that everything's perfect. And, and, and everything was really changing. And then Donald Trump was elected and we kind of went backwards. But you know, it really is uh, the arch of time. <laughs> it's it's it seems to be getting better, I think. And I I recently read Walter I or listened on Audible to Walter Isaacson's wonderful biography of Jennifer Doudna, of course, who's a heroine for our time, and just the change between her experience, what happened to poor Marie Curie, and then, mm -hmm. of course, Rosalind. Franklin, whose data was just stolen by the guy, you know, by Watson mm -hmm. and Crick, and given her no credit for it. And and then I had recently listened to Rita Colwell's very bitter biography about her life. She was the first woman director of NSF. And then remembering my own experience where things were getting better. It was really in middle age when I started to have women colleagues of my own status, sort of. And we, 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 we actually formed support networks that were terribly, terribly important. And that's new, but Jennifer Doudna's generation is a whole new generation. It really is changing. Uh, but of course, uh, as of course women went into medicine, the uh, salaries for family practitioners went down. And there was this famous article about that time. Gravy train leaves 
just as women arrive at station. So mm-hmm. that's always a problem. Well, I, I wonder, though, there are some, I mean, part of your story is the unique um, capabilities of, of women. And, you know, there are certain professions like teaching and, and like, um, uh, you know, running um, daycare centers and, uh, you know, roles that, that were, were very much care oriented that have been dominated by, you know, by, by women. Um, is, it, is that, I mean, is that going to stay if we, if, you know, if, if the number of doctors and lawyers all uh, become 50, 50, then won't the, the number mathematically won't the number of, of sort of, you know, daycare um, managers have to also uh, become 50, 50. Or is, is there is there there is a, a there is a tremendous as I as I wrote in Mothers and Others there is a tremendous untapped potential for nurture in men. Mm-hmm. Uh, eliciting it takes a particular context, and how long the transformations last is not yet known. I only know of one study that kind of addresses that question. Anyway, it's something I'm writing about now. But you know, the reason I write, Greg, is to find out what I think because yeah. I really don't know. Right. And this kind of takes us back to where you started from with your whole issue of silos. And it's a big problem. It's especially a big problem if you're a young researcher looking for funding mm-hmm. and you want to do cross-disciplinary research. And there are a couple of NGOs and things now that are starting up to fund cross-disciplinary work and, and across silos, but it's very competitive because there's it's, it's not that common. Um, but, you know, in my case, because I'm really just a, an independent scholar off on my own, it's kind of the limits on how many silos I can integrate are really my own. They have to do with getting older, memory lapses, not being able to read, and the fact that neuroscientists don't write in English. It's just all acronyms, mm. and it's, it takes me a whole day to read one paper, and then I forget it the next day. I mean, these are my problems. But but within, if you're doing research, the silo problem is huge. Well, I have to say that this is a fantastically written book, and, and there's so many turns of phrases. Like, uh, I think you said the, the, the art of Babel preceded the gift of the gab, <laughs> And uh, there's some other ones for the grandmother from hell. You've got some really fantastic uh, phrases in here. And so you're doing a great job of stitching all this together. What about the next book? When is the next book coming out? And what's um, it called? Well, I, I, uh, uh, Pantheon had the right of first refusal on it. And I sent, or Peter Ginsburg at Curtis Brown sent the editor there my prospectus. And he looked at it and he said, oh, too many amphibians and turned it down. So I don't have a publisher. I don't know when it's coming out. <laughs> okay. Well, I look forward but to it. That goes to your point about silos, too many amphibians. Yeah. Amphibians <laughs> well, are we can, huge if you're interested in paternal care. <laughs> yeah. I think we can, we can learn, we can learn a lot from, uh, from all the animals. And in this book, you don't just limit yourself to primates. I mean, you've got some great stories about, you know, birds feeding fish. And I mean, there's just, there's just so much wonderful, the variety of, of parental approaches, uh, is just, it's just mind boggling. Do you um, know what's happening outside right now? We have a mother nanny goat who lost her young. She forgot them somewhere. And she is nursing her grandchildren. <laughs> That's <laughs> and well, I love it. You have an example in there of a, of a lion um, nur- nursing some uh, some antelopes, which uh, it, it's besides being very biblical, uh, I was uh, yeah. I was I was kind of astonished. It was pretty amazing. Well, you know, the great evolutionary theorist William Hamilton used to cite Darwin, who said, "If you ever find an animal behaving altruistically." To an animal it's not related to my whole theory kind of goes up in smoke you know no hamilton said that not not that yeah. but then he sent me a wonderful picture of a donkey nursing something else you know yeah yeah a, a lion it happens it does happen but i think it has to do with i think you can kind of misdirected paternal care that the threshold for responding in a nurturing way falls so low that you start to respond to to different stimuli mm-hmm and that's why we all have pets. Um, so <laughs> I really appreciate you, you joining know, me. You know, when you look into your dog's eyes, your oxytocin goes up, but so does your dog's. Yes, yes. You're finished, but I'll just tell you. 
Um, we harvest them in November. The best time to get walnuts is, uh, you know, right before Christmas and New Year's. And then we continue to sell them. And then around June or July, uh, Dan won't let me sell them anymore because he says they're too old and we don't. But in fact, they, they do great as long as you keep them frozen. Okay, so Citrona Farms, check them out. Um, thanks again, Sarah. Hope to talk to you again soon. Yeah, it was fun to talk to you. Hope our paths cross. Bye. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.